I'm joined today by an enchanting guest, Karen Doherty. And Karen is an ex is internationally renowned Scottish psychic medium. And her journey is an extraordinary tale of living at the intersection of the seen and the unseen, weaving connections between our world and the spirit world. Her life story unfolds like a cosmic dance, interweaving the mystical threads of her earliest memories, the influence of her grandmother, and the transformative power of mediumship that became the cornerstone of her purpose. Karen, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Peter. It's lovely to be here. Karen, can you take us back to those earliest moments of seeing people in the unseen realms? Yes, you know, when I get asked this, it's quite strange because I, it's almost like I have to search through my memory and anyone that's listening will know if you start to search through your memory, more stuff comes up that you didn't remember was even in there. And that's kind of what it feels like for me. And one of my earliest memories of seeing spirit was when I was three years old. And I remember being on a bus with my mum traveling to see my grandfather. And we, the bus went past a, a cemetery, a graveyard. And I remember looking out the window and saying to my mother at the time, who are all these people? Why are they all there walking about? And my mum just kind of looked and said, there's no one there. And I remember feeling, yes, there is. Like, why can't she see them? And then the thought that came into my mind, and this is the biggest thing that I can remember about that day, was I wonder if I'm buried in there. And I was only three years old. And that is the memory I have of that day. Now, at that time, my mum would have put it down to imagination or, you know, kids stuff. And, and that kind of continued for a little while through my earlier years. But then as I grew, maybe eight, nine, ten, I used to see people in my grandmother's house and I always used to say to her, oh, there's a lady in the kitchen and she would say, don't worry about it. It's the living that harm you, not the dead, you know, and she had all these sayings for things that would calm my mind or just make it very normal and natural for me. And later in my years, I, I did learn that my grandmother was very mediumistic as well, but she didn't really mm. use it in a professional way or go out and work as a medium. Incidentally, her sister did, and I learned that later as well. But yes, through the years, it's been mainly where I've seen people knowing that they're of the, another world, but not knowing why no one else could see them. How did those encounters shape your understanding of the world around you? It felt very natural for me to see them. I didn't see them all the time, like every day and everywhere I went. But when it did happen, it was like an inner knowledge. It was more like a wisdom that I already had to tell me that this is, this is okay. And it gave me an understanding from a young age that there's more than this. You know, it's bigger than this. It's bigger than us. It really did form that kind of opinion for me that this is temporary. This is okay. And no one had to tell me that. It was something that I deeply felt. Mm. And you mentioned your, your grandmother as well, because from what I've gleaned, she appears pivotal in your journey. How did traditional methods like tea leaves and premonition contribute to your development as a psychic medium? Well, one of my earliest memories is watching my grandmother at her kitchen table reading tea leaves for people that would come in. So although she didn't go out and do the work or, you know, not like now where we have social media and people know who you are, but she did have people that would come, friends and friends of friends that would come in and have tea leaves read at the kitchen table. And I do remember watching her and I remember watching her asking the person to turn the cup three times and then she would, you know, upturn it and read tea leaves. So even as, an, as a, a young child watching that, I was fascinated with that. And I remember just knowing that there was something in this. Going on from there, when she would talk to me about spirit, you know, if I asked about it or said something to her, she always had this way of reassuring me that it's all fine. This is normal. This is natural. And my mum used to always say, oh, I don't know where we got Karen. Karen's from the moon. That's what she always used to say. She's so different to our sisters and our cousins. Um, and my mum knew there was something different too, but she didn't really manage to put her finger on what it was at that point. But my grandmother seemed to just know and she could understand me. So that made me feel like 
I'm not on my own with this. I am understood somewhere. I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, my grandmother knows this. And I think watching her doing the tea leaves and the more traditional, even playing cards, she sometimes would have playing cards and she could read playing cards for people. So I knew that there was a, a depth to this mm. and that kind of shaped me a little bit, but not in a conscious way. It wasn't like I felt like, oh, my grandmother does that, so I'm going to do that. It was just a, a feeling of this is okay. This is going to be fine. You know, even at that point, not really know where my journey was going. What was that moment or realization? Did that mark the beginning of a deeper connection with spirit for you? My moment, I would call it, came much later, actually. It was probably in my early 20s when I was hearing a lot of spirit voices. Every night I would go to bed and every time I closed my eyes, I could hear lots of different voices coming in. And it actually got very overwhelming for me. It, it felt like I didn't want to close my eyes because I knew it was almost like, if you can imagine, a radio tuning in and out and lots of different voices going over one another. So it became overwhelming. And I, I, at the time, I had already always gone to spiritualist churches to watch mediums work. I read mediumship books, still not realizing that I was actually a medium, just feeling like I've got a great passion for this and an interest in it. So. When the voices started to come all the time, I spoke to a medium at a church and she said, well, it's because you've got to develop it. And I said, develop what? And she said, well, you're a medium. I said, I'm not a medium, you know, and I couldn't believe that she, she thought I was. She asked me to come along to a development circle, which was in Scotland, the old fashioned way of developing mediumship, sitting in a circle and practicing. And I went and I didn't even know. I thought, I have to go. I don't know why I'm going, but I went. And the minute I sat down, that was where my moment came. It was almost, oh, this is what it is. I just could feel spirit in there. I could feel the connection and I just felt like home. It, that's the only way I can describe it. Like mm. now I know. And then from that minute on, from the minute I sat in that circle, my development just took off and I've never stopped working with spirit since then. I see you as a bridge between the physical and the non-physical. How does this, you know, for listeners um, who may not be aware of this, how does the bridging process unfold and what is the significance of facilitating communication between the two realms? The bridging, I love that way of putting it, like that having that bridge between the two, because really that is what the medium is there to do, just there to blend the two worlds together. So my whole position in the communication is to obviously have the recipient, the sitter in front of me and blend with their energy, you know, allow them to feel old and ready and open by giving information or chatting or just, just getting them into a relaxed place really. And then the other side of me, we'll call it the mediumship side of it. I'm already blending with those that are in the spirit side and I can feel them coming in and I can feel them coming close to me and being ready for this communication. And me in the middle being that bridge, as you call it, it's really just a vessel. It's just an opening for the two worlds to blend together. Uh, and it is needed because although we can talk to our loved ones ourselves, it's like every person, mediumistic or not, can speak to your loved ones. You don't often hear them coming back with anything or it can be very faint mm. or very vague. So a medium's job is to really bring evidential mediumship to prove that there's a life after this physical life. Given that an evidential mediumship, are there any specific methods or techniques that you employ to ensure the information that you convey is accurate and undeniable for your clients? I wouldn't say there's any certain technique. What I do is ju I'm just a very natural person. So when I work, there is no setup for that. It's really just about me knowing and trusting that spirit will come, come in and step forward. And when they do, I, I often say to them that those on the spirit side, just allow me to step into your shoes. Show me your life through your eyes. Let me see and let me feel and let me hear and just every sense of mine you can use. So I give permission straight away for them to do whatever they need to do in order for me to 
gain that evidence so that I know it's accurate and so that I know it's strong. Because unfortunately, within mediumship, there is mediumship out there or people saying they're doing mediumship and it's not evidential. Someone might say, I've got your grandmother here and she's telling me that you're going to get a new house in April. Well, that's not evidential because you've not given any evidence of the grandmother. You know, most of us have got a grandmother in spirit at points and the, the house thing might be correct information even, but that's a psychic thing. So the medium or psychic could have picked up on that psychically and you're putting words in the grandmother's mouth because you've not proved the connection with the grandmother. So it has to be evidential first about the person that steps forward so that the person in front of you can say, yes, that's my dad. Yes, that's my mum or whoever it might be. And they don't have any doubt because of the evidence that you've brought them. And then any messages, anything else that comes in will validate other parts of their life. Well, was there a poignant experience where the evidence provided during a session had a profound impact offering solace or confirmation beyond doubt? There's been a f you know, a few over the years. I mean, the, the amount of readings I've done, and it's hard to remember any specific one because when I work, I will make sure that some, you know, that the evidence is there. Um, but I remember one that jumps to mind, uh, it was an event, it was an audience. And I had finished speaking to the lady that I was working with and I just said to her at the end, do you wear a necklace with an angel wing on it? And she said, no. And I said, okay, that's fine. And as I pulled away, I thought there's something about that. And the woman behind her put her hand up and said, I am. And I said, I've got to come to you. So I went to her and I immediately felt her son. And I knew he was only 10 when he passed away. And I knew how he passed and I gave all the evidence, specific evidence. And she was saying, yes, 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 that's correct. And there was so much of it. But I felt like this is not reaching her. I don't know. Like the information's correct, but I can feel that she is still not being touched, you know, in the soul mm -hmm. with this. So I kept going and, and I, I'm on a time frame because it's an audience. And so I kind of had to end it there. And I said, thank you so much for speaking with me. But as I pulled away, I just felt, I don't know that that really got to her, like that she knows this is her son, even though she agreed with everything. So as I turned to take a drink of water, I said to the little boy in the spirit side, I need you to tell me your name. It's the only thing that your mum's going, going to believe. And he said immediately, Kai. So I turned around and I said, I've got to come back to you. His name was Kai. And the, the whole change in that woman, and she started to cry and she, she couldn't believe it. And Every other aspect of the evidence was there, but she needed something else and I could feel that. Um, and she spoke to me afterwards and said, it wasn't that I wasn't believing you. I, everything you said was correct, but I just needed that, you know, just that one thing. So that made a huge impact um, on that lady. Um, and another one that jumps in mind was a funny one because a lady came for a reading and she brought her husband with her and I could tell him as soon as he came in, he's a major skeptic. I don't even know why he's here. So he comes in and sits down and he sat in the corner and he said to me, I don't want to be here. I, she's asking me to come. And he was quite, you know, forthright with it. And I said, that's fine. And I knew immediately his dad came in. I knew and I thought I'm going to have to go to him. So I said, well, look, I'm going to come to you, to the wife, and, but I'm going to him first. And I could see him looking like, oh, no, don't even try. So I brought his dad in and I gave that and I gave his name and everything. And he was like, yeah how did you get that and I said well I'm connecting with them and so we talked it through but I gave him a few things but two things that I gave him specifically he couldn't take one of them was your mum uh, lit a candle for him in a church in Italy after he passed and he said absolutely not my mum's never been to Italy nope 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 and I said okay well that's what I'm getting and the other one was he's showing me a ship steering wheel and there's an ornament of this or something, a statue or an ornament or something. And he said, absolutely not. My dad's nothing to do with ships or sailing. And I said, okay, that's fine. Well, he phoned me about a week later and he said, I just asked my mum about the, the candle. And she said, yes, I did. And she went on a cruise after the father had passed and it had stopped in Italy and he didn't know. So she said, that's true. And he said about the, the ship's steering wheel and she went in the loft and she brought it down and, and she had it. So. He was amazed, but he phoned me about three times after that. And he kept saying, Karen, I just need to know how you got that. I'm just not sure about this. And I talked to him through it a few times. 
And on the last call, he said, it's changed my life because I did not believe that my dad was still there and you've communicated with him. So that has a major impact. And that's really what you do it for, to bring healing for people in whatever form they need it. But it also brings healing to those that are in the spirit side too. That's beautiful. In terms of navigating your responsibility of delivering evidence, how do you ensure it profoundly impacts the lives of those seeking connection, but while maintaining their emotional well-being? Yeah, that is something you have to be aware of as a medium because it is a responsibility. Sometimes I've had people coming to me that are really so bereft and, and in terrible grief or people that are vulnerable about things in their own life as well. And you're very acutely aware that whatever you say has an impact. So again, that's why it's important to me to make sure what I'm getting is correct and it comes from their loved ones. So anything that comes from your loved ones in the spirit side is going to help but not hinder and not bring fear. That's another thing that I'm not okay with when I hear that a medium might have said something that left the person worried or concerned or fearful. That just doesn't happen. The spirit world will not come and do that for, for their loved one. So for me, the responsibility side of it weighs really heavy and I'm always aware of that because it changes the course of someone's life. Whatever you say can change the course of someone's life or how they feel about something. So I always really make sure that whatever I deliver is diplomatic, it's said with love, it's said with positivity and anything that can be deemed as negative, which is not even a word that I like using within mediumship, but there are things that will come out that someone might feel, is, let's say they're in a position in their life that's not particularly good at that point in time. If that has to be addressed, I always will still address it in a way that will help the person make decisions to move along in their life mm -hmm. and not bring everything to the forefront and then leave them to sit there and worry about it. And I think You've always got to be aware of that as a medium. I know you've mentioned it, but just to re-emphasize this, is that why is it crucial for mediums to strive for accuracy and specificity in their messages? And how does it enhance the overall impact on the recipient? Well, it's important to do that because we all live similar lives. And we can address an audience or a one-to-one -one situation and say very similar things. You know, there's a man in the spirit side, he's on your dad's side of the family. You know, there might have been heart trouble there. He worked with people or he used his hands. There's nothing specific in that really, because mm. really that could apply to probably 90% of the people in the room or, or you know, 90% of the people that come to see you. So it's important to strive for the specifics so that that person puts their hand up or you speak to them in a one-to-one -one situation and undoubtedly they know that it's their father or they know that it's that person yes. that you're saying it is. Because there's so much generic things that are said by some mediums. So anybody can say there's a grandmother in the spirit world and, you know, she's got grey hair and she baked and because that certain generation, that's what people did. That doesn't mean that everybody done it, but in certain generations, that's a very generic statement. So how how is that proving who you've got? It just doesn't prove who you've got. So it's important to bring specifics. You know, I've got your father here. I know that he passed when he was 70 or in his 70s. I know that he had a blood condition. I know that he was in hospital. I know that there were three people around his bed. I know that he spoke to someone just before he passed and they didn't know he was going to pass. Any of these things would be more specific. You know, you still have his key ring. These are specifics. And this kind of information is what's going to make the person say, that is definitely my dad. And it has to be that way. I feel very strongly about it. I know maybe not everyone feels that, but I do. That's really important. I'm, I'm glad you re-emphasized that. Thank you for sharing that. And in terms of the principles of evidential mediumship and the application in everyday life, how can one apply the principles of evidential mediumship in everyday life to foster a deeper understanding of the unseen world and enhance our spiritual connection? 
Well, the principles of mediumship or the principles of connecting with spirit is first to realize that you are spirit. So I think that if you know that and have that knowledge that you are spirit in human form, that's a massive part to understanding how the connection can work. Because if you feel like you don't know that information or you're human and you're in the physical sense, how on earth are you ever going to be able to foster that connection with the spirit side? So firstly, it's about understanding that you are spirit, that intuition that you have, the gut instinct, the hunches you have, all of that comes from your higher self. It doesn't come from the human brain. So if you can understand that firstly, then I would suggest that you learn to connect with nature. Maybe it's going out for a walk. Maybe it's just feeling things around you or walking into a room and just trying to sense the energy of the room. Because every single person can do that. You don't have to be a medium to do that. Every one of us has psychic ability, albeit to varying degrees of development. But we all have it because we all come from the spirit side. We inhabit a body, we live here, and then we go home to the spirit side. Mm. So when we come here, we have that psychic ability, that mind-to-mind communication and work from an energy perspective but because we are human we forget that we've got that and because we're so engulfed in physical life sometimes it's hard to make that connection but if you can do a little bit of meditation it doesn't need to be like an hour's meditation every day even going for a walk even just sit and listen to a piece of music or closing your eyes for five minutes just really to lift yourself and to understand that when you go within you make connection to spirit when you can go within and do that to your own spirit, you then can expand that to those that live in the spirit side of life. Mm. Yeah, it, it, I recognize from meditation that it leaves me free occupied rather than preoccupied. And with the practice over some years, it, it gets to that point where it's just empty space, but it makes you a pause of vacuum. So things start to come in mm-hmm. and, yeah, exactly um, and then, you that. know, like I was saying earlier, it's about measurement and interpretation as a mentor, how do you guide others in developing their skills and evidential mediumship, but ensuring they uphold the integrity of the practice and provide meaningful evidence? Well, with my mentorship, I developed it because when I first started, I didn't feel that I had a mentor. I didn't feel that I could ask questions or figure things out. And it is quite a lonely path when you're doing your development if you don't have someone to ask or someone to lean on a little bit because there are questions that come up and sometimes you don't trust your own answers. It's a thing that you need. And I had many different tutors. I would travel to the Arthur Finlay College and do courses there. And so I had tutors, but not someone on hand to ask. So when I had gone through that, I made my mind up that at a certain point I would develop a mentorship so that any students that were coming on to that have me there personally to answer questions, to help them with their development. And one thing that I do with students is kind of see what they need because every person needs something different. And Mm. this is why group mentorships for me don't entirely work for me personally, because I just feel like every medium is unique and we can't make mediums. If you're a medium, you're born to be a medium. So it's more about your teacher being able to kind of blend your energy and find out exactly what it is you need, not what the next person needs or the next medium needs. And for me, that's an important part of it. And really within my teaching, it would always be from a principal point of view, it would always be from an authentic point of view and how to uphold that integrity as you work. That's a massive part of it for me. So that's definitely something I pass on really at a foundation level. Mm. In terms of the unseen world and spirit and the afterlife, can you shed some light on the nature of the unseen worlds and how they coexist with our reality? How do these realms intersect and influence each other. Yeah, it's, it's quite a, you know, a massive um, <laughs> subject, like, isn't it? Like, it's I, like weird. As I was asking that. you the question, I was thinking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we'll try. Um, yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, it's an unseen world and it's a world that blends with ours. People talk about the spirit side or the spirit realms like they're far away or they're above or and it's not like that. We actually are very intertwined all the time. We're very blended all the time, but it's just like being on a different frequency. So if you can imagine a radio where you have to tune things in to, you know, gain that communication, it's the same thing. So they are around us all the time. They do blend with us all the time. Their energy is part of our energy. But they also have their own learning to do. They also go on and do the things they want to do to evolve their soul because evolving doesn't stop when you leave here. This is just a, being on the earth is a very, very small part of us. It's a very tiny part to our whole journey. So when we go back home to spirit, then we continue to evolve. So they will be doing what they're doing there. It might be learning. It might be helping others. It might be something that they wanted for their experience. Uh, as well and they will continue to do that but the minute we think of them the minute we ask them to be around us or come close to us they are absolutely there there is no time in the spirit side of life there's only time in the physical sense so someone passes away my own mother she's been passed away now for seven years but to my mum it doesn't feel like seven years my mum will just be there she'll be present there's no time my mum's not over there counting the years or the days or the months It's only us that do that. So our loved ones are never away from us, really. And even if it was 20 years before you crossed over after someone, the minute you see them, the minute you're with them, you're with them. There's not like this feeling of, oh, I've not seen you for 20 years. It doesn't work like that over there. It's hard for us to understand because we are so conditioned here in this But I think if you can remember that there is no time, they're never far away. The minute you think of them, they pull in close to you, to your energy. And the the influence on our life that they have is not where they will tell us what to do or make decisions for us. As a medium, I get a lot of people coming for readings and they want me to tell them what decision they should make. They might say, oh, I wanted my mum to tell me about this relationship or whatever it might be. Well, they can't do that. They can share thoughts. They can bring influence in the way that they can guide us to our own thoughts. So it might be that they show us signs or symbols or just give us a feeling to remember ourselves and remember what we really feel about a certain situation. But they can't make decisions because we all have free will here and it's not for someone else to come and tell us what to do. So in that aspect to it, they don't rule us or tell us, but they will guide us to a better understanding of something. And I know in speaking with you earlier that maintaining the emotional well-being of your clients is paramount. How do you approach a session to ensure it is a safe and nurturing and brave space for them, especially considering the often sensitive nature of the messages that you convey? Yeah, I mean, again, it's such an important thing to do. And it's more about me letting them know what's going to take place, what's going to maybe come through, not in a specific way. Like I'm not telling them at the beginning, oh, I'm going to get X, Y, and Z. But it's more about saying, you know, whatever comes will be healing. Whatever comes, it's the communication that's meant to come forward to help you in some way. It will also help your loved ones as well. So it's really creating that relaxed space for them to understand what's going to take place. Uh, Some people come and it's their first time coming and they don't know what to expect. And quite a lot of the time, people are fearful. They don't know. They might. A lot of people that come say, I just don't want to hear anything bad. And I always have to say, there's never anything bad. They're not going to bring you anything that's going to put you in a worse state of fear or concern or worry. They're not going to do that. So It's really about, like you say, that nurturing place, first of all, Mm -hmm. and creating that space and holding space and saying to them, we're we're holding space together here for your loved one to step forward. This is going, going to be okay. And I think if you talk to the recipients like that first, break down any barriers that they may feel, then it just makes it a better experience. And also another thing that I'm quite, you know, passionate about is saying to them, You know, if you cry, you cry. If your emotions come out, they come out. This is a healing experience. It's absolutely fine because a lot of people, especially I'd say in the UK, but a lot of people are so scared to show their emotion about anything, very reserved, you know, walls are up. And I always say, but you're going to be talking to your mum or you're going to be talking to your daughter or whoever it might be. Please don't hang on to that. Just let it flow. 
And I think when you create that space, it puts them in the mind that they're safe and that it's going to be all right. Have there been any situations where you've had to navigate a particular situation where the information that you've received may be sensitive or potentially unsettling for a client? And yeah. therefore, how do you strike that balance between honesty and ensuring their emotional welfare? Yeah, it's a tough one because really, you know, that the person might be hearing something that they maybe don't want to hear in respect of who's coming through. I've had numerous times, actually, maybe there's someone has came through from the spirit side and maybe there was an abusive relationship or something that was very distressing. For the recipient, one lady stands out and it was her father that came through and immediately I knew. As soon as I felt him come in, I knew she doesn't want this. But my job as the medium is to still let her know what I'm picking up. So I had to say to her, listen, I know I've got someone here for you and I don't feel that you want this contact, but I have to let you know that this person has stepped forward and straight away she looked and I knew by her face. And I said, I know it's your father. I said, I know that you don't want that at this time. Is that correct? And she said, yes, I don't want to talk to my father. And I said, that's okay then. So then I had to say to the father in the spirit side, thank you for coming, but this is not the right time. And he understood, he understood. But what transpired from that really was, I was able to tell her what I knew that had happened between them. And I also then was able to say to her, your dad really just wants you, wants to come in to, to heal this situation. It's not that he wants to come in to upset you, but he won't come unless you want him to come. That's okay. But you might change your mind in time. And if you do, he will be there to help heal the situation. And by the time she left, she felt much better about it. Straight away, she was like, I kind of mm. feel like that's settled something. I don't know what, I still don't want to talk to him, but it has given me something. So. There's been times where that's happened. There's been times where, you know, maybe someone has been unwell and I might pick up that it's not, you know, that, that they're not going to be healed. I'm not going to say to someone, oh, you know, someone's going to pass away. That would never come from me. But I will then be able to go into it and say, you know, I'm picking up that your father-in-law at the moment isn't well. Is that true? Yes. And I know that he's been in hospital and there's lots of tests. Well, please know that spirit are around him and they're helping him as much as they can. And that way it gives a more positive thing, but still lets them know that spirit are around that father-in-law. You know, so you've just kind of got to be diplomatic and know what you're saying has impact. This just might be a strange thought, but I don't know if there's a question in it, but are there ethical guidelines that you follow to ensure that the messages shared respect the boundaries and privacy of both the living and the spirit? There is in, in ways. I mean, the thing is for me, the spirit side won't come through and give me anything that's not meant to be shared. Okay. But it's different in an event. You know, I do events and sometimes there's 100 people there, sometimes there's 200, sometimes there's 50. So, but it's always a public thing. There's no way I would sh share certain information at a public event, even though I might pick it up. So if I was at an event and I was picking up like that situation about that lady's father, there's no way I'm sharing that in an event. I just would not do it. So it would be a matter of picking other things up or saying to the lady, you know, I'll talk to you afterwards, you know, or whatever, because there's no way I'm going to share sensitive information in front of other people. So that's an ethics thing for me. And that to me is, it's really common sense in my book. But believe me, again, I've seen mediums do it where They've actually shared in public someone's whole life, vulnerable side of their life. And you can tell that the person's uncomfortable with it. And I'm just like, you don't do that. You know, you can't do that. And it doesn't matter that the person's attended the event and maybe it'll come out anyway. You have to have a responsibility about it. I'm really interested in the impact on personal growth because I see this in a way as a personal growth journey and beyond offering solace and comfort, how does your work contribute to the personal growth and empowerment of your clients? Do you have a story where a session catalyzed significant positive change in someone's life? 
I think it actually happens a lot, Peter, in people's lives when they've been. Now, obviously, it doesn't happen with every person. You can't control that or you can't, you know, make that happen. But I think I've been really blessed to read for lots of people where when they go away, they do make change within their own life and their own personal growth. So it might be that someone's there and maybe their relationship isn't the best or maybe their life decisions haven't been the best. And because of the reading that they receive and the evidence from spirit, it inspires them to take a different direction, it inspires them to change their lives or to lift themselves up or to know that they're worthy of more or whatever it might be. But you can see when that person leaves that their whole dynamic of life has changed. And students too, you know, I say to students all the time, the biggest thing you will get out of developing mediumship, if that's what you're here to do, is your own development. Your own development is huge when you first begin. And I really changed my whole outlook on life. Even though I knew spirit existed and all these things, when I actually started to, to develop me and my mediumship, my outlook on life changed, the way I felt about things changed, relationships, friendships, all changed because I was taking my own power and walking within my own power of spirit. And it really is transformational. It really is. Mm -hmm. you know, it's beautiful work that you're doing. You mentioned earlier, we were talking about vulnerability, the potential vulnerability, especially those who are seeking connection. How do you ensure that the messages that are conveyed foster healing as distinct from dependency? What role does, does that empowerment play in your mediumship? Well, I think it's important to let the person know that anything that comes from the reading, as in healing, is about empowerment for them instead of them. Like I've had people coming back for readings and saying, when can I come back? And, you know, how long do you need to leave it in between? And I never give someone a, like a time frame. I always say, you come back when you need to come back. It's not for me to decide. But inevitably, sometimes people will come back because they still want you to tell them about their life. And this is what keeps them going. And in that circumstance, I would always really try to empower them instead and say, listen, you don't need me to tell you this. This is about you doing X, Y, and Z to change things or to understand what's taking place. So that healing does take place within that person's life. Because being dependent on other people for that change or for direction is not really what the work is. The work is really to allow the person to understand that they are spirit and that they can go forward and that healing is within them. And then on top of that, the communication helps that. It helps the impact of that. So if you're doing your work correctly, you should always, as a medium, be able to foster that healing process and get that healing started if it hasn't already and show the person where to go to continue that healing process without having to endlessly give them that direction and I think some people will take longer than others because you don't know what people have gone through and there are some people that come and I when they leave I just think I don't even know how they're standing I don't even know after what they've been through and the loss they've had I am so inspired by that person because I just think that's phenomenal that they're still functioning you know after things I've heard some really really distressing and harrowing situations in people's lives uh, and I just think they're amazing for still being able to function in this side of life so I get inspired by it too you know as mm -hmm. the medium I'm very blessed and very honored to work with so many different people and it, it really creates that inspiration for me too so I hope that I give that out too well, there's definitely a mutual co-shaping that goes on in that situation, as is in any kind of face-to-face -face situation, but more so as well in this sort of sensitive arena. And as an in influential figure in the realm of evidential mediumship, and I want to take this just broader in the sense of how do you believe the ethical standards that you uphold can contribute to shaping a more positive and respectful perception of this practice in society. Yeah, I mean, that's something that I hope and wish for all the time because unfortunately the, the 
time that we live in at the moment where everything's so express fast you know you can go online and get anything you can go online and speak to a medium tomorrow you can get a psychic reading you can go on tiktok or any social media and you can see it all there but unfortunately the ethics aren't always there and it's very quick you know i want it now and people don't understand that mediumship is sacred and mm. communicating with spirit is sacred it's not an everyday thing that everyone can do just like you know nip into the shop and buying something off the shelf so i think that the ethical side of it for me is to keep promoting the sacredness of spirit keep letting people know that look this is something really really special although the this other world is there and of course it exists and your loved ones are there when you have communication or blending of the two worlds it's phenomenal it's not something that can be bought or you know click of the fingers and it's there it's really really special and if you go down that route of things and try to help people understand that it's not an easy thing. I mean, being a medium is not an easy thing, even though it comes naturally to me as a medium. It's not like I, I pick up a telephone and get all the information on the telephone. It, it really is a lot of work through different ways of working and different energy and, and knowing what to do with it and different interpretations. So it's really quite difficult for mediums. And I think, unfortunately, this fast time that we live in and because everything's social media, people just think it's nothing. People just say, oh, yeah, you're a medium. Oh, you know, can you contact my dad? You know, and it's said almost like, come on then, let's, you know, prove it. Whereas you're taking away a beautiful blending of someone and their father. And the father is in the spirit side, desperate to speak to his daughter. And the daughter's desperate to speak to the father. And you're creating that space for that to happen. Well, it can't happen like that if everyone, you know, every man and their dog is suddenly a medium or a psychic. It takes it away. So I think the real genuine mediums out there will always push for the ethical side of things. And thankfully, there are many wonderful mediums out there doing that. But unfortunately, on the flip side of that, there's damage that gets done as well through other means. There's always the light and the shadow side. There is. In every in a part of life. But I think you're right, this whole machinery of distraction and instant gratification and instant labeling and I can be a medium tomorrow and yeah. I, I can't tell you the amount of messages I get to read my tarot or mm -hmm. to give me a psychic reading but as a bridge between worlds what do you find most rewarding and challenging about your work in connecting with spirit world the most rewarding part of my work is to know that you have made an impact within what you can do for someone meaning promote that healing in both sides you know so when I work with spirit after the reading or after the event I will always thank spirit for coming forward and I, I will always thank them for allowing me to be part of that blending of the two worlds and I will also always take care of their people so part of it for me is saying to a father in the spirit side or a mother in the spirit side I know that your daughter's coming today I'll take care of her for you this will be okay because I am grateful that that spirit person is coming to me to make that communication with their loved one. So I want to make sure they know I will take care of their people in this world too. And that is a hugely rewarding part when I know that that mother or father in the spirit world is truly grateful for that communication and knows that they've reached their loved one. So that for me is massive. That's the rewarding part in providing that knowledge that it's okay your loved ones are still here the challenging part to that i suppose is that you are met with a lot of skepticism you are met with people saying negative things it doesn't bother me as such in the respect of you know if someone walked up to me in the street and said well i think you're a fraud or i don't think that you do what you say you do or i think that you're taking advantage of vulnerable people none of that bothers me because i know i work for spirit so that wouldn't even touch me it wouldn't throw me off or anything but it is challenging sometimes when the the person that maybe is coming for the reading is told, I wouldn't do it. You know, it's bad, it's fraudulent, it's this and that, because then you're met with that person coming to you for the reading and you already know their barriers are up and they're maybe a bit frightened. And I was working in America recently and three lovely ladies came for readings and what one after another, they all came in and sat down and they all said, I, I really shouldn't be here. So I've not told anyone I'm here because I spoke to my um, priest and they said not to do this. 
beliefs and there are many different religions and I'm not saying you know that religion's bad or anything like that I don't believe that I think if you have a faith in anything it's wonderful but it shouldn't promote fear and it shouldn't yeah. stop you from trying to make a connection to your God whoever that may be or your loved ones whatever it might be and I felt for them and that was challenging and then every one of them walked away and had who they wanted to come and speak to and the ball said right when you're coming back we're booking back to come and see you in six months time because it gave them such a lift and they weren't frightened after it and they came in fearful so that's a challenging aspect to the work but you do tend to get past these things as a medium you just have to understand that there are many different ways of looking at things and all you can do is your work now i'm glad you pointed that out because it does take a measure of resilience and persistence to do what i would call the holy work that you did um and in your ongoing journey as a psychic medium what aspirations do you hold for the future both for yourself and for the field of mediumship as a whole I mean, for myself, I, I'm continuing my own development too. So as a medium, I think it's very important not to become complacent and not to feel like you've arrived and you're a medium and that's it now. I always tend to do my own development. Uh, I'm in the middle of um, writing a book about my mediumship journey to help other people. Uh, I sit for trans mediumship, which is a deeper form of mediumship which isn't a public thing, but it's for my own development, but also for those that sit with me and allowing guides to come forward and talk and spirit people to come forward. That's a different side to the mediumship as in, you know, the one-to-ones that I might do at the moment or the events. I'm going to continue along that route because I feel that spirit have got more to say through my mediumship. So I will just continue to do that and develop that so I can facilitate that for them. But opening that up, to making an impact, I suppose, is really just promoting genuine, genuine mediumship and also an understanding and knowledge of mediumship, meaning it's not what you see on Facebook. It's not what you might get, you know, out in the street, someone walks up to you. That's not what it's about. It's about healing and it's about connection and it's about understanding. It's not just about the message. It's not just about the quick message you might get from someone. It's about more than that. It's about understanding who you are. Do you know that you are spirit in human form? And that's what I feel very passionate about because if people realize that, then they will know that their loved ones are never far away. And then they will also know that they are only here for a short amount of time also to make an impact in their own lives too. And as we near the end of this profound exploration, I'd love to just hear your perspective on the intersection of self-love and spiritual growth how does cultivating self-love play a role in one's ability to connect with the unseen and navigate the journey of mediumship you know self-love is hard really for everyone I, I feel because we are conditioned in this world so we might be born into a family where there was situations that didn't promote self-love or maybe there's been you know things that you've been involved in in your life that didn't feel like love or it might be that you never really found your confidence within yourself so our environment plays a massive part to how we are as adults childhood you're shaped as a child and depending on what you've gone through in your life and what you've seen will tell you how you're going to be so I think finding self-love is a massive thing in itself but if you can find that if you can you know, do practices about self-love, whether it's meditation, whether it's being kind to yourself, giving yourself kind words, understanding what your past is, where you want to be in the future and where you are in the present. All of these things will promote the self-love. And if you can do that and be good to yourself and know that whatever journey you've been on is a journey of learning and you are working towards that self-love all the time, if you can get there, then that also teaches you an unconditional love and unconditional love comes from the spirit your own spirit but those that are, dwell over in the spirit side as well so you can then form that communication you can hold space and a practice that I would tell people to do really which I think is an amazing way to do it is maybe do a small meditation and create a, a room within your mind so you'll close your eyes you'll go into meditation and just really visualize a room within your mind. It doesn't need to be a room inside. It could be the beach. It could be the park. It could be a room inside. 
but just a space where you feel comfortable and you feel that you could go. And every time you see that space, you will invite your loved ones in to be with you in that space. And you have to trust that it will happen. It might not happen the first time. It might not happen every time, but it will happen. And you will go to the same space every time. And when you start to practice that, you will know the minute you go there, you're safe, you're loved, and you will feel your own spirit. You will feel their spirit. And it really just creates a bigger connection. Oh, that's beautiful. Karen, that's so beautiful. I love that imagery. Something I'm going to take on as a practice. Thank you. Where can people find you? And do you have any passing words? People can find me at my website, which is karendoherty.com. Everything's on there. Social media as well as Karen Doherty, Medium and Mentor. But you can contact me through my website and it is me that answers, you know, everything. So if anyone does have questions or want to uh, get in touch, it will be me that answers it personally for them. And really parting words, I feel, you know, just remind yourselves, anyone who's listening, remind yourselves that first and foremost, you are spirit in human form. Know that you're powerful. Know that as you walk through this life, it's not always easy. There are lessons being learned all the time, but take your blessings too. you know take the time to understand that life is very temporary and it's not always an easy life but there are many blessings in it too and if you can concentrate on that and know that you're surrounded by your loved ones it makes walking this earth just that little bit easier it's very powerful thank you so much karen it's been an extraordinary journey delving into the realms of spirit with you and evidential mediumship and really the profound impact of your work and your insights have undoubtedly illuminated the path for me and for listeners. And I really want to express my deepest gratitude to you, Karen, for sharing your wisdom, your experiences, and the transformative power of mediumship with us today, your dedication to ethical practice, client well-being, and the broader societal impact of mediumship serves as a true inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been amazing to be here. It really has been amazing.